So what's exciting to me is this crossing of the boundary into interactive content, which I see as a fourth wave uh, of a very broad kind of innovation that we're doing with content marketing. Um, so what is it? The, the working definition I use is that it's content that has software functionality. Uh, fair warning, I'm a software geek, so when I look at things, I tend to look at the world and say, hey, that's a little bit like software. Um, so this is content that behaves like software. It actually is software. And the audience actively participates with the content instead of just passively consuming it. You know, so sort of one way we can like look and compare and contrast. Um, so passive content is things that you read, you watch, you listen to. It's stuff like blogs, eBooks, reports, webinars. Um, and uh, the primary thing that we've been, you know, delivering with this content is information, a certain amount of entertainment too, but mostly information uh, in the marketing context, uh, and a lot of innovation. I call that innovation around media, the way in which this stuff actually appears, where it appears, how it appears. Um, but this, this notion of interactive content, these are things like, uh, you know, quizzes and games and assessments and configurators and calculators and all sorts of, you know, stuff that you actually, the, the, the audience has to participate with it. Uh, and in this case, you know, we're often not just delivering information, but we're very often also delivering services. You know, if any of you have read Jay Baer's book, uh, Utility, right, you know, a phenomenal idea here of starting to think about how as marketers can we offer services that are useful to our prospects. And that the innovation that we see with interactive content is more around the idea of mechanisms, which is how this stuff actually functions. And so this is uh, really exciting for us as marketers. It's, it, it is a new um, dimension by which we can innovate, um, but it does require us learning some new skills. So uh, just so we're all on the same page, right? When we talk interactive content, uh, you know, the, the obvious example is quizzes. Uh, the mother of all quizzes that really got this thing, uh, you know, in high gear was the BuzzFeed quiz. You know, what state do you actually belong in? Um, you know, uh, I'm sure everyone here has seen this at some point, right? You're picking your favorite fast food chain. You know, which TV show do you find most appealing? Uh, you know, what animal do you feel represents you? A squirrel, nut. Um, and then at the end, it, it, it you know, crunches this and it tells you what state you're in. And so I went through and I took this and it uh, told me that I belong in Wyoming. Now, I'm kind of an East Coast nerdy guy. I think my life expectancy in Wyoming is probably somewhere on about 40 to 45 minutes. Uh, so I'm not entirely sure that the algorithm they were using here was correct. But, right, I mean, the BuzzFeed thing was fine. In fact, it was more than fine. It was successful in the sense that it got a lot of attention. It got that engagement. You know, over 40 million people engaged with this thing. And uh, Mary Meeker of Kleiner Perkins actually called that out, you know, as one of the ways that she saw people, publishers, reimagining content in this world where you could have an interactive nature. It wasn't just uh, passively consuming. Now, I know, I know, BuzzFeed is one of these things where you're like, you, you can play that sort of comparison game of BuzzFeed quizzes are to interactive content what the National Choir is to journalism. Um, I mean, it's, it's fun at the checkout counter, but, you know, for us as marketers, like, what's, what's the real value there? Um, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's fine to ask these things about, you know, have uh, BuzzFeed do these, you know, sort of little quizzes things, but we wouldn't actually see a reputable publication do this. I mean, it's not like you would see the New York Times suddenly offering its readers, you know, to engage in quizzes. Um, but, of course, we have now seen the New York Times do a lot of this. Uh, one example that I just grabbed was uh, they wrote a story. This is, this is so meta. They wrote a story about how technology was now allowing the creation of content algorithmically. Uh, and so how would you, uh, you know, particularly uh, for things like, you know, sports and weather and all, you know, financial reports, all these things where could you as a human being tell the difference between something written by a computer or written by a human? Uh, and in addition to actually describing this in the story, classic passive content, they provide a quiz that lets you walk through a number of these examples to say, okay, well, here's, here's a paragraph. 
Did the computer write this or did a human write this? Um, and in the interest of time, I won't go through this uh, here, but you know, it's actually a very fascinating uh, quiz. Uh, you might want to consider Googling that afterwards. So what's going on here? Why, why does that work? What, what's the human mechanism? Um, when I was first uh, working on interactive content, uh, there was a professor I knew at uh, uh, the Harvard Computer Science Group who was not a marketing person. I think he genuinely, he's one of those people who when they hear the word you know, marketing, it's like a word association, they're like, you know, oh, that's not good. Um, I'm like, so here's what I do. I, I write software and marketing. He's just like, hmm. You know, but I was talking with him about this, and at one point his eyes like literally like lit up. And he was like, I can, I can tell you why these things are getting the results they are. Um, uh, we actually, he rifled through some papers and he had uh, just been reading about this study that they did with high school students um, in uh, physics classes where they had run this experiment where, it's a meta experiment here again, um, you know, teachers taught the lesson two different ways. One, they just, you know, taught the lesson straight up, uh, you know, and then three weeks later there was a quiz on it. Uh, and then in the other form, what they did was they started, before they even ran through the experiments with the class, they would ask the students to predict what they thought the outcomes of these experiments would be. And just by even taking a little bit of time to think about that, it changed the, uh, the, the recall uh, that these students had for these concepts when they actually did see the outcome. And so uh, it was something like on the order of like a 20% higher uh, recall. I mean, this is a significant finding. And in many ways, this makes sense, right? I mean, we know from our own experience in school, right? I mean, you know, it's one thing to have uh, someone, you know, just uh, drone on in a lecture. It's, uh, you know, one thing to have someone give you a stack of textbooks and say, okay, go home and just read all of this. Um, and it's another thing to have those teachers who really engage the class in discussions and activities. And decades of educational research has shown that that approach has, has much higher outcomes. And the funny thing is, for us as marketers, right, one of the key reasons we are doing interactive content, why we claim we are, uh, why we're doing content in general, is to help educate our audience. So why wouldn't we want to pull from the results the insights of all this educational uh, research that has been done over decades for what is the best way to educate folks. 